Well, good morning and um, really warm welcome to you this morning. It's great to be together, great to see you. Welcome if you're uh, visiting and uh, you're not normally with us, but um, it's great to be together this morning. Let me read a verse for us from our passage. Pete is going to preach for us later on. But Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for it is by grace, by grace you have been saved and through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So as we work our way through Ephesians, we've been thinking about God's big plan, a plan which he planned from before the foundation of the world, thinking about God's big prayer for his people, that they would trust in God's plan and uh, come to know him better and better. And so today we come to think about God's big grace. God's big grace, that is, that he gives people a part in his plan that certainly don't deserve it and could never earn it. It is all by grace. And we're going to be thinking a little bit about this idea of before and after. Uh, you were like this, Paul is going to say, but now. So our passage begins today. You were dead in your sins. And then verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy has made us alive. So as we gather here this morning, uh, we gather not because we uh, are worthy, not because we're good enough, not because we've had a perfect week. We gather because our God is a God of grace, a God who is rich in grace, a God who takes people who aren't suitable, worthy, deserving, and he lavishes grace on them. 
So let me lead us in a prayer. Let's pray together. But because of his great love for us, our Father God, as we come together this morning, might we be bowled over afresh by your love, by the riches of your grace, by your undeserved mercy. Our Father, as we come, might we not be trusting in ourselves, but in you alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, to help us a little bit with this feeling that we get in the passage of uh, Paul saying, this is what you were like when I lavished my grace on you. This is what I've done for you, even though you don't deserve it. Uh, we're going to begin um, with our time of confession. We're going to begin by taking uh, a few moments together to say sorry to God and to acknowledge before God what we are like by ourselves, on our own, without Jesus. And then we're going to respond uh, in the only way that is fitting, really, respond in praise and thankfulness to God for all that he's done for us. So we're going to sing a couple of songs uh, together. But this is how Paul begins as he reminds God's people of what they are like without Jesus. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. So we're going to confess our sin. And there's a little response to when I say, Lord, please forgive us. We can join in together and say, save us and help us. Lord, please forgive us, save us, and help us. So let's pray together. Our Father God, we want to admit this morning that without you, without your free gift of grace, there is nothing about us, nothing in us, that can deserve or earn your salvation. Lord, please forgive us. Save us and help us. And gracious God, when we think that we are better than others, more deserving than others, when we rely on ourselves instead of the riches of your grace, Lord, please forgive us, save us and help us. And holy God, when we forget just how holy you are, when we deny our sinful nature and we question your right and your good anger at sin. Lord, please forgive us, save us, and help us. On verse 4 again, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. So our Father God, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his forgiveness, for your grace and your mercy. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. By his death, you have given us new life. And so by your continual presence with us, give us eternal joy. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, as uncomfortable as it is to remember what we're like without Jesus, to think about what we are like on our own without him, that we are dead in transgressions and sins, it's fitting to do that because then we remember just how glorious and wonderful his grace is. And so we're going to praise God together. And uh, we know, don't we, that all people should praise uh, God. So we're going to use the words of Psalm 67. Um, I think we'll stand because we're going to sing in a moment. Should we stand? And uh, Psalm 67 is a psalm of praise. And it's fitting that we praise God for his mercy, his grace. And uh, we'll join in uh, with this response together. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Should we say that together? May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. So may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power 
among the nations. Together, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Together, let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. So as we stand, we're going to sing two songs of praise uh, together. And uh, the first uh, one here, the call of the kingdom, uh, just reminds us of God who is rich in mercy. So let's sing together. Hear the call of the kingdom, lift your eyes to the king, let his song rise. Sorry, I was in the wrong key. I was in the wrong key. There we go. I was thinking, that's better. Hear the call of the kingdom, lift your eyes to the king, let his song rise within you as a fragrant
now as we stand. Father God, we want to acknowledge every spiritual blessing that there is only in Christ. We want to say how much we need him and need the forgiveness, the life, the redemption, the acceptance that comes through him because of your grace and your mercy. Father, we praise you that in Jesus you can make those who are dead in sin and transgressions alive again. So we praise you for Jesus this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. Children are going to head over to the halls uh, in a moment for their groups. But I said we were going to think a little bit about this uh, before and after theme. We've um, seen it a little bit already in Ephesians chapter 2 that um, Paul says, you were dead in transgressions and sins before Jesus uh, came and died and offered salvation, offered to make us alive again. So I wanted us to think a little bit about this uh, theme. So I've got some pictures, okay, of things that um, um, I want to know what they become. Okay, what do I become? So I'm going to show you before, and I want you to tell me after. Okay, hopefully you'll get, um, you'll get the idea. Okay, so um, that's before. Um, can anybody, can everyone see what that is? Is that clear enough? What's that? Go on, Zoe. A caterpillar. It is a caterpillar. Okay, so we're thinking about, if that's before, what's after? Um, Jed's hand's gone up. You think it's going to be a butterfly. You think a caterpillar becomes a butterfly after. Should we have a look? Oh, look at that. Well done, fantastic. There we go, so you get the idea. I've only got a few of these. Um, here we go. What's that? Can someone share that out for us? Oh. Oh, there we go. Rosie's got it. We've got a conquer. Okay, this is going to test your horticultural knowledge now. What does, um, I won't accept conquer tree. I might, I might accept conquer tree. But uh, what does a conquer become when it, um, when it changes and flourishes and grows? Uh, go on, Immy. Very good. Is that what you're all thinking? Horse, chestnut tree. I had to Google that to check that. But uh, otherwise, I would have said of oak tree. But um, there we go. A conquer becomes a horse. Check, look at that. There's a mighty tree. Isn't that amazing transformation? You would never think, would you, that a tree like that, that you could climb and um, shale, shade under, shelter under, could come from a, a conquer. Okay, now this one's a little bit harder, okay, because I've given you some sort of um, uh, indiscriminate black rock. I want you to think, okay, that this black rock is under immense, immense pressure at the center of the earth. Okay, it's really, really hot. Ben's got an answer. What does it become, Ben? Fire. Oh, yes, it could be, couldn't it, if it was coal? Yes, very good. It's not what I was thinking. This is kind of guess what's in my head, isn't it? Go on, Jed. Coal. Yes, okay, that's good. I like it. Um, go on. <laughs> oh, okay, so you guys are on the right track, but... If you squash it for a long, long time and it gets really hot and you really squash it, look at that. Look at that. Graphite, coal, I don't know quite the science. Someone will come and correct me afterwards and say it's all wrong. But there we go. Um, a diamond after millions of years. Um, that's what you get. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, okay. This gets a little bit interesting, isn't it? So we've got an egg. Okay. Uh, Sam, go on. A bird. Yeah, so you think a bird is going to hatch out of the egg. Okay, should we see if Sam's right? What do you think? You think it's a chick getting quite specific about what kind of bird? Okay, look at that. Yes, there's a hen, but <laughs> there is an alternative, isn't there? Because um, what you get from an egg, uh, well, you get, your, um, you, get your, oop, you get your tea, you get your egg on toast as well. Look at that. An egg and an egg. Look at that. Yes, you do, you get an egg and an egg. Um, and that got me thinking, I've got one more here. What about if we start with the chicken? <laughs> Rosie said which comes first and we could spend a lot of time. What do you get if you start with the chicken? What does the chicken become? Roast chicken. Oh, okay. <laughs> Henry said roast chicken. What were you going to say, Amy? No. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit early, isn't it? So it's not actually even been roasted yet, but there we go. Um, can anybody, can, can you cope with the raw chicken on the screen? Um, and I ended up with that picture, the hen becoming a dead hen, <laughs> uh, because... Well, that's the exact opposite way around, isn't it, from what Paul is saying about us. Paul is saying, 
that us, without Jesus, us without the miracle of Jesus working in our hearts, us without God's grace, us without God's mercy, well, spiritually, that is what we are like. It's what our hearts are like. <laughs> it is as dead as whatever kind of, uh, if you're having meat today, whatever kind of meat is in your fridge ready to go in the oven. When you go to Tesco or wherever you go to do your shopping, other shops are available, and you go to the frozen meat section, they're not, the, the birds are not running around, are they? And the cows are not mooing and grazing in the aisles of Tesco because they are dead. And Paul says, your heart without Jesus is just like that. You and me, all of us. And so here is the wonder, the amazing wonder and truth of the gospel that Paul says, Ephesians 2 verse 5, even though that's what we're like on our own without Jesus, we are spiritually dead. Uh, Paul says, uh, he has made us alive. God has made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. See, to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus, to become alive spiritually, you don't have to do things. You don't have to kind of pull your moral socks up. We need Jesus to make us alive again, even while we are dead. And that is what he has done for us. So, like, shall I lead us in a prayer? And then our children are going to head over uh, to their groups, and crash as well is going to happen in the halls. Let me pray for us. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the way that Paul reminds us what we were without Jesus, what we are because of Jesus, made alive, even when we were dead in sin. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that uh, Jesus uh, doesn't uh, expect us to kind of help ourselves. He knows we can't, and so he offers to do it all for us. So we pray you would teach us this morning to love Jesus, to follow Jesus more and more. Pray for our children and their leaders, for the crash, and for us in here as we look at your word. Be with us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, the young people are going to head over to the halls. And uh, whilst they're doing that, uh, why don't you reach for uh, a Bible near you? And uh, we're going to have our reading in just a moment. Thank you, Helen. So in those Bibles you've just reached for, we're on page 1108. And it will come as no surprise to you that the reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, help us to hear your word, to rejoice in it, and to apply it to our lives. Amen. So, today, we're in at the deep end with the bad news. We've had the big plan of a big God, and we've had his big prayer, or Paul's big prayer to that big God. But now, we have a reminder of the bad news. You were dead in transgressions and sins. There is no ducking the truth. We used to break the rules, to cross the boundaries. That's transgressing, and we sinned as well. When I first learnt how to present the gospel, we always started off with the bad news. It's not that Paul starts there. Paul starts this short letter with this big sweep of salvation history. He starts it with the big God and his big prayer for us. But this week we do get to these three verses of bad news. We were dead. Matt's gone through that already. What about that ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit at work in the disobedient? The letter is not just about the concrete here and now. It broadens our horizon to look at the spiritual battles that rage beyond the world that we see with our eyes. This is big picture stuff. We were dead. Our non-Christian friends are still dead. Rather like the person on the screen. They've got everything. The lovely pram, the lovely baby, the lovely clothes, the lovely dog, the nice walks in the countryside. But they are deserving of wrath. We don't want them to carry on doing all their nice stuff but never finding Jesus, do we? Because that way leads to destruction. And we, we who are saved, we who belong to Jesus, cannot feel superior because you were, the before, you were dead. But because God came in search of us, we are no longer dead. We can make light of living the world's way. That's why we can fall back so easily. What is wrong with keeping your stuff nice, of taking care of your possessions, of dressing well? There's nothing wrong with it in itself. But it can displace God in our affections. If we get to wanting that stuff, charging after it, making every effort to save up for whatever it is that soon gets scratched and tarnished and broken. If that becomes our goal, that becomes our God, We've got it wrong. We should live in the world, but we are not of the world. Our hearts should be set on God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Because we are no longer dead, God made us alive with Christ. 
This is true on earth, and it's also true in the heavenly realms with Christ. We have been lifted with him already, but also eternally. That's what verse 6 is about. And in this letter, Paul's painting that big picture of how God and man fit together. And he's already told us in chapter 1 that we are adopted into his family. We are heirs, legal heirs, of God the Father, the creator of the universe. And he's given that to his son Jesus, but he's also made that available to us by adoption. And that's how special we are to God. Another way of picturing it is that we've got the best seats in heaven. We are raised with him, with Christ, to sit with him. And we are already there. But it's only in the coming ages that the fullness of this will de be demonstrated. That's what verse 7 is about. Big God is just that. The generosity he shows in granting us to be adopted into his family, to become full-blown heirs alongside Jesus, is still there. And we come to that classic statement in verses 4 and 5. Creator God loves you, and you, and you, and you. It's not a lukewarm, well, they're all right, love. The God of the universe loves you so much and is so full of mercy, click, oh, we've got the battery thing. <sighs> He's so full of mercy that he has made us alive. No longer dead in transgression and sin, alive with Christ. Jesus was hung on a cross and he died and he was poked in the side with a spear just to be sure he really was dead and sealed in a freshly sorted out cave. And the power of the creator God raised him back to life. And that makes the way clear for you and me to be made alive with him too. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Now, you know the shorthand definition of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Grace. We have been given grace. God is not a bully. He's done the work. He is generous beyond anything we deserve. He takes rebels like you and me and builds a loving relationship with us. There is no coercion. And similarly, we should not bully or blackmail folk into coming to church or into the kingdom because it won't work and it won't last. Kindness gentleness, self-control. They're the fruit of the Spirit and they're the characteristics we need to display to one another and to our non-Christian friends to draw them to Jesus. And the phrase at the end of verse 5 is so key to understanding the good news or the gospel 
that we proclaim that Paul repeats it and extends it in verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. There's no proof of being saved, it's through faith. But there is experience. We can experience the freedom from those things that weigh us down when we commit our lives to God. And we have to trust him and accept him at his word. We have been saved. And now we get to where I think the passage is actually going. And it's almost a paradox. Because we have this thought in verse 9, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We do not contribute anything to the work of saving fallen creation. It all comes from God. And that aspect of himself that came to earth in the person of Jesus, the Christ, or the Messiah. He did everything. We just have to believe in him. And we were reminded in verse 3 that all of us also lived in sin and transgression. No one can boast of their salvation. We are all equal in our debt to God for working such a miracle in our life. But then, Paul assures us that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We set that against the not by works so that no one can boast. God's big plan involves you and you and you. We have a purpose. We were made, crafted. We don't look like the person next to us. We are ourselves. We are individuals. And we have an individual place in God's plan. We've been saved. We respond thankfully by doing the different things he has assigned to each one of us. The church is the body of Christ. Some are hands, Others eyes, some ears, some the small intestines. Each part is needed for a fully functioning body. The analogy isn't perfect because our roles can change as God calls us to different activities at different times. So, what are you doing for the body of Christ in Prenton. What part are you called to play? It might be that your employment is your main calling. For others, it might be caring for your neighbours. There might be room in your life to preach or teach or administer within the church. Each task meshes with others. Some are small, or seem to be, and some appear to be larger. But do whatever it is that you were created to do this week. Not to earn your freedom from sin, you can't, but to do 
what you were created for. After all, God has prepared things in advance for us to do. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you created each one of us and assigned us things to do in your kingdom. Help us by your Holy Spirit to recognize those tasks that you have called each person here to do. Some apparently big, some smaller, but all necessary for your plans to work out. We ask because we want to bring glory to your name, O oh, Heavenly Father. Amen. Thank you very much for leading us through those verses. Well, we're going to uh, respond firstly by affirming our faith together. We've just been reminded, haven't we? We've got a big God who made us, a big God who's redeemed us, and a big God who wants to use you in his plans and purposes. And we're going to affirm that uh, as we uh, declare our faith together. So shall we stand? And uh, then we're going to sing as well. So let me ask you these questions. Do you believe and trust in God the Father who made the world? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're going to remain standing and sing of God's uh, grace, the grace alone by which he saves us. Now 
Please do be seated, and Robert is going to come and lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the great love shown to each of us, making us alive with Christ. Thank you for the reminder in this letter to the Ephesians that the same great power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in us to change us and to make us more like him. Thank you for the grace you showed to each of us by giving us faith so that we believe in you and the work of your son, Jesus. We are not deserving of this, but we are very thankful and our hearts are full of praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Help us in our daily life reflect the work you are doing in us to bring praise and glory to your name. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those suffering in Ukraine, those who are living in fear and just do not know what to do or where to go. We ask that you, by your great power and wisdom, would stop the outrages and restore peace to this battered nation. Lord, hear us. We pray for our nation and request that compassion is shown to those in desperate need, to those who are struggling to pay energy bills and find food for their families. We ask, Lord, that those in government effect change which will help, and we pray for good government that reflects your love and concern for all people. Lord, hear us. We pray for our children and students who are preparing to take examinations in the near future. We ask that their preparations do bear fruit in terms of successful outcomes and that they will be free from stress as they trust in you in their daily life. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious. We pray for the forthcoming visit of the Bishop of Chester, Bishop Mark, and ask that those who are preparing for confirmation would know your presence and guidance and peace as they take this step in faith. Lord, hear us. In our lives here, Lord, at St. Stephen's, we ask that all we prepare in terms of meetings and outreach would bear fruit that your church would be strengthened and your gospel proclaimed. In this same manner, Lord, we ask that those living in Prenton Wood Court, Prenton Way and Prenton Village Road would be encouraged and changed by the work of your Holy Spirit in their lives and would come to know Jesus as Lord. Lord, hear us. For those who need prayer at this time, we bring before you Mark Hughes, Jake Barry, Karen Robinson, Mick, Andrew Jeans, Fiona Poynton, Barry Harding, Ted Harrison, Janet Jones, Jean Keeley, James McCulloch, and Richard Martin. And for those who are grieving for the death of John Williams, Peter Sharp, Martin Krellin, we ask that you bring the comfort of your presence. We pray now for a few moments for those known to ourselves who need prayer.
Lord, hear us. Let us now say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. But thank you very much for leading our prayers. Um, well, I hope um, uh, you've got your diaries and the pens or diaries on your phones, because it feels like there's lots of things uh, happening. I'll, uh, I'll rattle through um, a few things. Um, we've got our cafe service this evening. We've been thinking this morning about... Um, God's um, uh, uh, salvation, his grace, his mercy in Jesus. And uh, we're going to drill down tonight particularly uh, into how it is that Jesus gives life by his death on the cross. So uh, you're very warmly uh, welcome and invited to come 6.30 p.m. Um, tonight. That's um, in here, our cafe service. Um, and then we're resuming our Christianity Explored course. Um, uh, it's on Zoom. It's at 8 o'clock uh, on Monday evenings, and that's continuing from uh, tomorrow night. And uh, we have started already, but um, if you would like to join in with that, um, you would be really welcome. Or if you know someone who'd like to, um, just come and speak to me about that. So that's tomorrow night. Um, the other course that we run is a short course. Christianity Explored is about seven sessions. Hope Explored is three sessions. And we're going to be running that at the end of June and start of uh, July on a Monday afternoon. And uh, we'd love to welcome you. Um, or uh, there are some flyers at the back if you can think of someone you'd like to invite uh, to that. Um, three short sessions just to think about um, hope and peace and purpose through Jesus and his life and death and resurrection. Um, and then this uh, Thursday evening is um, Ascension Day. Well, this Thursday is Ascension Day. We've got a service um, in the evening. And um, Ascension Day itself is actually the date of our 125th um, anniversary. That's uh, the date the memorial stone was laid. So uh, we're going to have a service at 8 o'clock on Thursday. And that will be in here, a service of communion. And um, you'd be very welcome uh, to come along to that. Um, getting um, ready for all, uh, the bishop arriving on Sunday, we're going to have a gardening party on Saturday morning, and um, uh, for the next, um, the, the last Saturday of May, the last Saturday of June, and the last but one Saturday, just to keep you on your toes, uh, of July. We're going to gather and do some work um, uh, on the ground, so if you are available for half an hour, an hour um, or so, that'd be wonderful um, to have you here with us. Um, and then next Sunday is, um, it's our celebration service. Um, Robert's already prayed for Henry and Peter, who are being confirmed. Um, so God willing, the Bishop of Chester will be here. Um, and he's going to preach on the next section of Ephesians, but it's also the verse that is on uh, the memorial stone, the foundation uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, so it would be great to be reminded uh, by Bishop, uh, Bishop Mark to stay rooted and built on Jesus Christ as our cornerstone um, do be praying for Peter and, um, and Henry this week as well as they prepare for uh, confirmation and um, um, plan to stay. I, I'm aware that people are baking cakes and things, so there'll be uh, refreshments and cakes um, afterwards to enjoy as we celebrate together. So that's next Sunday at uh, 10.30. Um, then our um, Jubilee cream tea is the following weekend, uh, the big bank holiday weekend um, on Sunday the 5th, and uh, we're praying for sunshine yeah, in the vicarage garden for that. Um, and then a date just a little bit further into the future. Um, we're hosting an event um, organized by the World Gospel Partnership. So that's various churches around the world uh, that seek together to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Um, and this event is um, it's more about churches um, to think about rather than, um, uh, than sort of thinking about guests and inviting others, but thinking how can we as churches who as Pete spoke about this morning, have that wonderful privilege of being adopted into God's family. We don't deserve it, but he welcomes us in, makes us his children, pours his blessing on us. Um, uh, what, what can we do to um, be supporting and praying for and aware of uh, the really important work of fostering and adopting as church families? So that's a Wednesday evening, 22nd of June, and um, we're hosting it here at St. Stephen's, so it's easy to get to. And... Um, uh, I'd warmly uh, commend that evening to you. 
Um, I think those were... Oh, no, I had one more notice, uh, which is to say that um, the Mother's Union had uh, a coffee morning yesterday, and uh, Jean says that um, after all the hard work, they raised over £750 yesterday morning. So um, if you were involved in making that happen, well done, and thank you. And if you came and, um, uh, and spent your uh, hard-earned money, um, thank you very much for supporting in that way. That's a wonderful amount raised. Oh, I don't know. Um, Rosie says that, um, uh, as, we, as I said last week, we were uh, keen uh, particularly to have flowers when the bishop comes um, next week. So there's a lovely, um, it's been um, decorated so you can't miss it, but there's a sign-up sheet at the back. If on any Sunday you would like to donate money uh, to contribute towards flowers and decorating the building, you can do that. But um, uh, if you would like to donate for next Sunday, that would be uh, very um, gladly received. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to join uh, briefly after the service for communion. Come and join me in the Lady Chapel for that. Uh, And we'll be staying for tea and coffee as well. But first, we're going to sing of God's big grace. And um, it felt like we had to choose it. There was no option, really, was there, Pete? Um, We're going to sing Amazing Grace. So, shall we stand together and let's sing this hymn to finish? This not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Our Father, we pray that as we go from this place this morning, we pray that we would be eager to do all that you have prepared for us, all that you made us for, having made us alive. Help us to live for you and to sing your praise in all that we are, all that we do this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please do take a seat.